Welcome. Since the turn of the millennium, since about the year 2000, no African country, not even South Africa, has received more attention in the Western media than Zimbabwe. It may be worth pondering why this should be so. The word crisis is perhaps overly used with regard to Africa, but I have no hesitation in applying it to Zimbabwe today. Part of the crisis is undoubtedly driven by very high prevalence rates of HIV and AIDS, the epidemic pandemic which we surveyed in our previous lecture. In this lecture, I want to turn towards the political and economic aspects of this situation. Let's begin by reviewing briefly some aspects of Zimbabwe and Zimbabwe's history encountered in previous lectures. Zimbabwe, of course, is named for the magnificent stone ruins, the largest in Africa, south of the Nile Valley, which stood at the center of an old empire, Great Zimbabwe. Modern Zimbabwe, of course, originally was southern Rhodesia. It was the British colony founded by, financed by, and named for. Cecil Rhodes, whom we have certainly encountered before in the series. In several earlier lectures, I made a distinction between settler colonies and non-settler colonies. In fact, I emphasize that for my money, this was a more important distinction than the differences, for instance, between French versus British versus Portuguese colonialism and so forth. A settler colony, again, is simply a place where substantial numbers of persons from the colonizing country, in this case Britain, come and intend to stay, set down roots. Southern Rhodesia was a settler colony, although never more, even at their peak, uh, than 4% of the total population. Whites here were numerous enough to enjoy, essentially, settler self-government within the British Empire from 1924 onwards. The hallmark of settler colonies was the expropriation of African land. Again, colonialism happened all over the African continent, but in many colonies, non-settler colonies, whatever Africans may have lost, they did not lose the possession in the direct sense of their land. In southern Rhodesia, however, about half the better half, it will not surprise us, of the total arable land, cultivable land, in the country was held by a relatively small number, still several thousand European farming families. It is that land division which is the absolutely critical starting point for understanding the unfolding of the Zimbabwean crisis in the 21st century. Now, Zimbabwe, when it was southern Rhodesia, from 1953, to 1963 was part of the Central African Federation. And we looked at the breakup of that federation, which at one point had bound together the countries now known as Zambia, Malawi, and Zimbabwe, broke apart in 1963 precisely on the question of whether there would be a transition to a majority rule African government. Britain, by this time, had accepted that for its colonies, but the white settlers of southern Rhodesia had very different ideas. In 1965, under the leadership of the redoubtable Ian Smith, they declared unilaterally independence from Great Britain, and indeed the country was renamed Rhodesia. There was no need for the southern after northern Rhodesia had become Zambia. The Unilateral Declaration of Independence, the UDI, was followed in turn rather quickly by the banning prohibition of uh, essentially all the African nationalist movements, which had emerged as they had all over the continent in the 1950s and early 60s to, to challenge colonial rule. As is typical of settler colonies, and the point we have made before, uh, the path to decolonization and the path to independence was not peaceful at all. Following their banning, their illegalization, the African national movements uh, launched uh, a, a national war of liberation known still today in Zimbabwe as the Second Shimoringa, Shimoringa being the Shona word for, for struggle. 
and they launched this from uh, neighboring countries, as is typical of guerrilla warfare uh, anywhere. All through the 1970s, this second Shimmeringa, this war raged through the colony of Rhodesia. It led to some 30,000 people dead, a million refugees. As I said at a previous juncture, uh, horrific things were done by all sides in this very bitter war. Eventually, by the, eight, uh, by the 1970s, the late 1970s, Smith had concluded that it was fruitless to continue to try to hold on forever, that he would negotiate as best he could a, a, a deal, a post-independence deal, and uh, the Lancaster House negotiations took place uh, centered in London. The results of that led to Zimbabwe's first national, uh, remotely democratic election in 1980. And at that moment, in 1980, the victory went to Robert Gabriel Mugabe and his party, formerly one of the two main liberation movements, Mugabe's party known as the Zimbabwe African National Union, or ZANU. It had been allied on paper, though rarely in practice, with the other principal liberation organization, the Zimbabwe African People's Union. They had formed the, people, the Patriotic Front. ZANU-PF became the ruling party of independent Zimbabwe at independence on April 18, 1980. Now, who is Robert Gabriel Mugabe? He was, he is, in many respects, uh, a brilliant and remarkable character. He's a devout Catholic. He was raised, in fact, on a Catholic mission in north-central Zimbabwe. And he was part of that generation of the, the 1950s, youth which took very seriously the promises and hopes of decolonization and independence. It is not at all inaccurate, I think, to apply the word idealistic to Mugabe at this stage. And in fact, he left Rhodesia and went to the Mecca of African independence in the late 1950s. And that, of course, was the country of Ghana in West Africa, led by the father of African nationalism, Kwame Nkrumah. Mugabe taught school in Ghana. And in fact, married a Ghanaian woman who later, when they returned to Zimbabwe, became Amai Mugabe, the mother of the nation, despite the fact that her roots, in fact, came from a different part of the continent. A very highly respected figure I found in my experience uh, in Zimbabwe. Now, when Mugabe returned to Rhodesia in the early 1960s, he became active with ZANU, with the Zimbabwe African National Union. Eventually, he was imprisoned by the settler regime of Ian Smith in the mid-1960s, and he spent approximately a decade, approximately 1965 to 1975, in one of Smith's prisons. Now, Mugabe's intelligence, and indeed uh, his intellectual bent, is demonstrated by the fact that while he was in prison, he actually earned multiple graduate degrees through correspondence courses. It was in this period that his own ideology sort of crystallized, and he became an articulate advocate of Marxian revolution at one, at, on one level, but never really abandoned a, a quite practical and pragmatic approach to politics and, and to power, on the other hand. He was released as part of an abortive peace initiative, which came in 1975, uh, and quickly escaped to Mozambique. Mozambique, next door to the east of uh, Rhodesia at this time, of course, had just become independent of the Portuguese. And the new rulers of Mozambique, anxious to show a kind of solidarity, if you like, across the African borders, allowed ZANU to establish numerous bases from Mozambique. This was truly one of the, the crucial turning points in the second Shimmeringa in the Zimbabwe uh, war. Mugabe in Mozambique quickly rose through the ranks and by the late, uh, mid to late 1970s certainly was the undisputed leader and spokesperson for ZANU. Now, in 1980, when 
Mugabe and his power were victorious in this first democratic national election in, in the new country. He was told by his old friend at the independence uh, ceremonies, Julius Nyerere, president of Tanzania still at that point, president for almost two decades by that point and with considerable uh, experience. Nyerere told him, you have inherited a jewel, keep it that way. And for the first decade after 1980, in many respects, Mugabe and his party did keep it that way. There's a sort of echo in Zimbabwean history of the experience of many other African countries 20 years earlier, when we looked at the first decade after independence in country after country and saw indisputable achievements and gains, which eventually turned uh, very differently. We saw some very impressive achievements indeed in the first decade of Zimbabwean independence, as well as some ominous signs. Mugabe, surprisingly to, to many, inured to his revolutionary uh, rhetoric, practiced, preached uh, racial reconciliation and independence, and not on a single occasion, did so quite uh, repeatedly and indeed for some time quite convincingly. Let me give you an idea of a manifesto issued by the, the party uh, in 1980. Quote, ZANU wishes to give the fullest assurance to the white community, the Asian and colored communities, again, colored has a specific meaning in Southern Africa, that as ZANU government can never in principle or in social or governmental practice discriminate against them. Racism, whether practiced by whites or blacks, is anathema to the humanitarian philosophy of ZANU. It is as primitive a dogma as tribalism or regionalism. Zimbabwe cannot just be a country of blacks. It is and should remain our country, all of us together. Well, impressive reconciliatory, conciliatory rhetoric uh, indeed. But remember, Mugabe had come to power behind or at the head of a guerrilla movement. Participation in his movement was fueled, after all, by popular resentment of white domination, and above all, probably, by resentment of the white control of so much land. On the other hand, just to put ourselves, in a sense, in the shoes of Robert Mugabe and his power as they take the reins of power, what are their options at that point? They come to power, I repeat, uh, behind the, the popular pressure against white rule and resentment of, of white land domination. On the other hand, these same white farms employed very large numbers of black workers, and they were enormously productive. In many respects, they were mechanized examples of modern high input, high output farming. They produced not only large amounts of foodstuffs, but were responsible for producing the bulk of Zimbabwe's leading export an earner of foreign exchange, earner of hard currency. And that was the export commodity of tobacco, again, largely grown on these, these white farms. And we've emphasized right through our look at 20th century, 21st century African history, that the reliance upon export commodities is something that was typical of the transformation of Africa in that century, and certainly nothing to be taken lightly. Now, Mugabe, in the early going, chose neither radical redistribution of white-owned land nor the strict preservation of the status quo ante. In other words, he did not uh, either accept the division of land, the unequal division of land that he inherited at independence. He pursued a middle course which saw some cautious resettlement of land-poor Africans while manta maintaining the economic advantages generated by large white commercial farms. Now, to some extent, his uh, caution here, this middle course, was dictated by the terms and features of the Constitution, which was hammered out at Lancaster House in the, 18, in the 1970s, in which he in, uh, inherited. In terms of land distribution, 
That constitution called for what is uh, usually termed a willing buyer, willing seller mechanism. In other words, land could not simply be condemned. It could not simply be expropriated by the state and redistributed to, to land poor uh, African farmers. It had to come from uh, paying essentially market prices for persons who were for willing to, to sell. That was the constitutional provision, of course, he could have ignored that constitution. He did not. And again, that needs to be recognized. I'll illustrate sort of both Mugabe's pursuit of this middle course, but also the sort of steel which lies beneath his, his um, personality from uh, a personal anecdote. President Robert Mugabe came to my hometown now of Raleigh, North Carolina, where I teach um, uh, history. And he came uh, as part of a, a visit which included visiting the United Nations and so forth and gave a speech at a neighboring institution to my own. He gave a speech at St. Augustine's University, St. Augustine's College, a traditionally African-American institution in downtown uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I have to pause here and, and mention that the welcome for uh, Mugabe's speech, after all, this was a sort of state occasion here, the welcoming address given by a pretty high-ranking uh, North Carolina official uh, created some uh, acute embarrassment on the part of myself and others. In seeking to find you know, commonalities between Zimbabwe and North Carolina, he mentioned a few things. For instance, he mentioned tobacco, which has certainly been part of the history of both places. He also stated that uh, both the state of North Carolina and Zimbabwe had cities uh, named Salisbury. And it's quite true. There's a Piedmont, North Carolina city named Salisbury. Salisbury, Rhodesia, had been the capital of that colony. It was named for Lord Salisbury, the British prime minister at the time that Rhodes had conquered and colonized the colony. The name had, in fact, been changed from Salisbury to Harare, immediately after independence for the same sort of reasons that the country changed its name from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. Our North Carolina official, alas, was apparently unaware of the, the change. Oh dear. My point in bringing up the speech is this. Mugabe talked about the land issue and he described the middle course that I've been talking about. You know, uh, purchasing some farms, redistributing a substantial amount, although not an earth-shaking amount, something like 35,000 families resettled in the first decade. He described that process, he described the constitutional provisions that he was observing in obtaining that land uh, on a willing seller, willing buyer basis. And at one point he said, we are required by the Constitution, I'm paraphrasing, but we are required by the Constitution uh, to, to purchase this land on the basis of willing buyer, willing seller. That is what we will do. The land that we need, we will pay for. And then he paused and looked very seriously at the audience and said, though we were never paid for it. Obviously making his political point despite the policy of moderation that he was enunciating. Now, in some respects, Mugabe attempted to compensate for relatively slow action on redistribution with some dramatic other measures. He extended many services to African peasant farmers who had not gotten more land, services which they had been denied under the old uh, settler regime. I'm talking about uh, high-level extension advice, hybrid seeds, so, uh, subsidies for fertilizer, improved transport to get crops to market, payment promptly and in full, and so on. In a lot of respects on the old so-called native reserves, there was a kind of agricultural revolution which took place in the 1980s. Food production multiplied out of those parts of the small-scale farming sector uh, several times over. The result was a nation which not only fed itself with major input from both of these farming sectors, but regularly exported to its often needful neighbors. And I certainly recall instances of being in Zambia, for instance, hearing of, reading of shipments of food uh, coming from next door in the so-called breadbasket of Southern Africa at that point. 
The country in the 1980s showed positive overall macroeconomic growth rates, GNP rates, while achieving remarkable advances in health and especially education at all levels. And remember, this is taking place in the 1980s, when in many uh, cases, or in many ways, the terms of trade, which we surveyed in looking at Africa's downturn from about the mid-1970s onward, you know, he's carrying this out and making these, these kinds of advances in a far less hospitable international climate that the, than the first generation of independence leaders had, had found themselves in. Now... On the other hand, Mugabe had already shown his iron fist, if you like, by unleashing the notorious North Korean-trained 5th Brigade to crush the so-called dissidents in the ethnically Indebele-dominated southwest of the country. This is still remembered as the Kukura Hundi in, in Shana. It's a reference for the fierce storms that sometimes uh, emerge here and pound the, uh, the ground. Anybody in Zimbabwe will recognize the terms like 5th Brigade, and to some, it will bring a bit of a shudder. Nonetheless, by the decade's end, he had lured the predominantly Indebele, Zapu Party, his old rivals, into his government. Uh, Joshua Nkomo, the leader of Zapu, was made a vice president. He had muted his call for an official one-party state, which he had made earlier on. But most troubling to all uh, was the increasingly brazen corruption of the elite. And this was symbolized by the 1989 so-called Willowgate scandal. The name, of course, is a play on Watergate, which had already become famous by then. And it involved access to essentially state-controlled cars. And it was clear that ministers and other parts of the elite were, were getting fantastic deals on cars that were not being made available to the rest of the middle class. The popular disgust with corruption which was growing around was captured by arguably Zimbabwe's most popular, maybe most famous artist. That is the singer Thomas Mafumo. He released an album in 1989 with a title and a title song uh, in English called Corruption, and it meant exactly what it said. Uh, the cover of that album showed a pair of right hands shaking hands and a pair of left hands with money uh, being transferred one to the other. The chorus uh, of that, that song, something for something, nothing for nothing, that's how it is in our country today, hit a raw nerve. Now, by the mid-1990s, Zimbabwe was still, however, a place which largely worked. I spent 1994 there as a, as a visiting Fulbright lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe. And a place that largely worked is more than could be said for a number of places elsewhere in the continent. But the negative trends accelerated. Employment was shrinking, prices rising. In the urban areas especially, there's increasingly open discontent. Corruption burgeoned. Mugabe funded the lavish lifestyle of his second wife, his former secretary, 40 years his junior, who was fond of flying on Air Force jets to Paris or Hong Kong for shopping sprees. Mugabe and his party's willingness to use heavy-handed intimidation against any form of dissidence or opposition continued unabated. In the late 1990s, he proposed a new constitution, further entrenching the ruling party's power, confident that he was still the hero of the people. He put it to a popular referendum, and in early 2000, the results were shocking. 55% of the populace voted no on this referendum. A few months later, despite every kind of intimidation and pro-ZANU saturation by the state-owned media, the opposition, now crystallized in an opposition party known and still known as the Movement for Democratic Change, very nearly displaced ZANU in the parliament, very nearly unseated this government. Mugabe reacted with fury and played what can only be called the land card. Soon, by late 2000, 2001, into 2002 and three, crowds of young men who were called war veterans, that is, wars, uh, veterans of the, uh, the Liberation War in the 1970s, began to occupy, take over, invade the white-owned farms. Now, there were called war veterans, and certainly some were, particularly at the, at, the, uh, at the top. But if you look at the footage, do the math with me. Someone who was 20 or 25 or 30 years old in 1980 at the conclusion of that war in 2000 would have been uh, 
40 or 45 or 50. Not these uh, in, in people who carried out the farm invasions. Most of them were in their late teenage, they were overwhelmingly male, late teenage and, 19, and, and people in their, in their 20s. They were drawn from the unemployed, desperate youth of the cities, given a club, literally given a club, and given uh, an occupation by the ruling party. Eventually, most of the white farmers were evicted. Some were beaten, a few were killed. Physically, however, it was overwhelmingly the black farm workers who suffered the most. These young men who occupied the farms in the first instance, um, through no fault of their own, after all they'd been raised in the city, were not experienced farmers. Often the re-expropriated farms did not even wind up in their hands, uh, let alone those of the land-hungry peasants, but in the possession of well-connected members of the elite, cabinet ministers, etc. Predictably, at least in the short run, the economy crashed by any measure. The former breadbasket of Africa became, by 2005, one of Africa's hungriest countries. The indicators are many of the, the tailspin in Zimbabwe. Think of its currency. When I first went to Zimbabwe in 1983, uh, a Zimbabwe dollar, that's the name of the currency, a Zim dollar was worth U.S. $1.40. In 2005, it was worth... The exchange rate was approximately 25,000 Zim dollars to one U.S. dollar. I never thought I'd see a day when the Zambian kwacha next door was worth more than the Zimbabwe dollar. Today, it's worth about five times as much. I had a student from Zimbabwe who told me that by this time, people in Zimbabwe were leaving the smaller currencies, the smaller notes, simply lying in the street. In 2005, the government launched as well a, a clearing operation against the, the squatter settlements, the shanty towns of thousands, probably tens or hundreds of thousands of people uh, around the capital city uh, in, particular, in particular. It was justified as the clearing of hotbeds of crime and, and disease. And indeed, there is certainly some truth uh, to that. But these were also hotbeds of opposition to the ZANU government. It had always been the urban areas from which most of the opposition came. The operation was called in Shona Operation Murambachina, Operation Drive Out Trash. Not exactly a flattering way to refer to your fellow uh, citizens. Mugabe seemed quite blasé about his nation's problems, uh, attributing all opposition and criticism to whites and to imperialists, especially and above all Britain, with the U.S. not far uh, behind. He and ZANU stayed smugly in power, returned in highly dubious uh, elections in 2002 and 2005. There's a tragedy about this. Had he retired in 1995 even, I think his place as the national hero in Zimbabwe would have been secure. I think at this point he will be remembered by many uh, very differently. I don't know of a clearer example of the old adage that power corrupts. Nonetheless, I'll close with, again, a personal incident. The last time I was in Zimbabwe, I was traveling in the capital city with my old supervisor in the economic history department. And we were driving, and first a, a truckload of, of youth chanting songs, a few of them carrying sticks or clubs. He said, that's the party youth. And indeed, uh, these are the ones who are the enforcers, the intimidator on part of the par a party. A little bit later, my friend saw a friend of his, a woman, friend of the family. We stopped, got out. She greeted us warmly with one of those Zimbabwean smiles that can light up a, a side street. Uh, we got back in the car and... My friend said that she was a, a, a high-ranking official in Zimbabwe's uh, leading human rights organization, that she'd been arrested in the previous month, one of several such arrests, and that here she was, greeting a friend, welcoming a stranger, and showing an absolute commitment to continuing her struggle, her speaking of truth to power. My friend kind of shook his head and he said, there's a lot of brave people in this country. I'm going to close this by paraphrasing William Faulkner. I think that those brave Zimbabweans will not only endure, they will prevail. Thank you.